Welcome to SSI Meetup. Today we'll be talking about Overlays 101, which is really interesting about how schemas can be used in the world of sovereign and how you can empower self-sovereign identity with this. Um, today we have with us Paul Notes, and he will be giving the first 30 minutes presentation. And then we will see if we can also talk with Robert uh, Midwiki, who will be doing who, who will be doing a demo hopefully, but just some technical issues because he has a Linux machine and we're not sure that if that will work. So we will find out during the presentation. If you go to the second slide, let me quickly remind you about um, what we're trying to do here. Basically, <coughs> with SSI Meetup, we want to empower global SSI communities um, and make this open to everyone so that everyone can use this information with a CC by SA, SA license, which means that it's open source and the only thing you have to do if you, we use this presentation, for example, is to credit Paul and Robert for using the material at SSI Meetup. And that will allow you to hopefully um, do a presentation about um, overlays in, in, in your local community or start creating a local community to talk about these kind of things. And that's a little bit of the objective here so that companies, individuals, and associations around the world can learn about decentralized digital identity. So, Paul, um, during the presentation, if anyone has a question, um, they will bring it up in the system and I'll, I'll, I'll share those questions with you. And um, and the floor is here for you. And thank you very much for joining us today. Perfect. Thank you. Thank you, Alex. Um, hello, everyone. Welcome to this uh, this edition of uh, SSI Meetup. Um, so I'm going to talk about uh, overlays and um, and it's, uh, overlays and how they relate relate to uh, schema. So um, you'll see on your screen here the the definition of a schema. Um, according to the sovereign glossary. Um, so I'll just quickly read that. A schema is a machine readable definition of the semantics of a data structure. Schemas are used to define the attributes used in one or more credential definitions. And then um, the overlay is, uh, is a data structure that provides an extra layer of contextual and or conditional information to a schema. This extra context can be used in an by an agent to transform how information is displayed to a viewer or to guide the agent in how to apply a custom process to schema data. So the, the way to look at this is, um, or with this architecture, is what we're trying to do is, is, is um, build an architecture where decentralizing uh, data is, uh, is very easy. And the way that we can do that is by keeping the schema in its most basic form and then any coloration or informational or um, conditional pieces, um, you can overlay them on top of a on top of that schema. So the advantage of that is that if you're building a schema within a trusted framework, um, you know it's coming from a trusted source. So for instance, if you wanted to decentralize a clinical trial, for example, you could have a demographic schema, uh, concomitant medication schema female fertility status schema. And then all of those schemas would be in, in, in basic form. And then you could have uh, Roche Pharmaceuticals, for example, would have their own set of overlays. Uh, Novartis, when they do a clinical trial, they could have their own set of overlays. Um, and so by using the same schema, they can just overlay um, their own versions, um, their own set of overlays on top of it. And the advantage of that is basically because everything's going through the base schema, if you're ever, ever looking to decentralize that data to a global data store, the data should be in, um, in great uh, structure to share. So then, uh, for instance, if researchers or application developers wanted access to, um, to usable data, it should be in better form to use. So, so why are overlays useful? Um, overlays allow an agent to add extra layers of conditional. Oh, hang on. Sorry about that. Let's just skip the slide. Um, they allow an agent to add extra layers of conditional or contextual information to a schema. Um, overlays allow an agent to update contextual information without having to reissue a schema. Overlays ensure that schema can remain generic, thus allowing diverse use cases per schema. Overlays ensure that schema definitions can remain in their simplest form, thus providing a standard base from which to decentralize data. 
And the final uh, point there is the overlay design has very little impact on the existing Hyperledger Indie solution. Um, so on that point, we are doing all of our development uh, on Hyperledger Indie at the moment, um, but the the idea is to make it pl platform agnostic so that you can use it on any platform, use these uh, this architecture on any platform. Okay, so the initial implementation, uh, we are um, using Sovereign um, to uh, for all of our um, initial work, and um, Sovereign's obviously the, the the code base for Sovereign is on Hyperledger Indie, so uh, all of the the base code is is on that ledger. Okay, Oop. so. So we're, we're working with various types of overlays at the moment. And uh, actually, there's a couple uh, that are not on here that, that are in development as well. So I'll br briefly mention those, but I won't go into them in too much detail. Um, so what you see on your screen here, the entry overlay, this is to add predefined field values uh, to schema attributes. Um, the conditional overlay is to add conditional programming to a schema. So that, So for instance, if you uh, wanted to have some sort of uh, logic where you say, you know, if if gender is equal to male, then answer these questions. If gender is equal to female, answer these questions. That that sort of conditional programming can be added in. The label overlay is to add category and attribute labels to schema attributes. Um, so a good example where you might use a label overlay is for language translations. Um, uh, and uh, the informational overlay is to add descriptions and contextual information to a schema. Um, so this would include service hints or informational text. Uh, you might even use, um, say you're an international company and you had uh, an office in the US and an office in the Philippines, uh, you could use an informational overlay to perhaps change some of the legal pros on the uh, uh, attached to the schema. Um, the sensitive overlay um, is for the holder only. Um, so what I mean by that is uh, um, rather than this overlay um, solely being available to the issuer of the schema, um, the holder also will have access to this overlay. And so uh, they can flag user-defined sensitive attributes. So for instance, if a, if a holder thought that you know, their gender was sensitive, um, they could uh, they could have some sort of filter at their end which would uh, which would flag it, and then the idea is that um, they could have uh, there could be a, a message pop up or something like that saying you know so and so is requesting this information uh, according to your sensitive overlay you've said that gender is sensitive um, are you sure you want to share that information that sort of stuff. And then the subset overlay is just to create a, a, a schema subset. So if you only want, want um, you know, two or three attributes from the schema, then you would use a subset overlay. All right. OK, so I'm just going it, to it's going to look like I'm going to veer a little bit left field here. But don't worry, this is all uh, this will all fit in in a minute. Um, when uh, when the GDPR came out, um, it, you know, it, it was it was very evident that from a legal uh, from a legal point of view, it was a great bit of legislature. But from a tech implementation point of view, um, it was found wanting. So obviously, myself as a tech person, um, if I wanted to, uh, if I need to know personally identify identifiable information (PII) about people, organizations, or things. I would actually want to see a taxonomy rather than a um, you know a hundred page legal document. So, having spoken to uh, Elizabeth Ramirez, who's the lead global counsel and a GDPR expert uh, at Evanim, she um, she agreed that uh, the legal that it was a better for a legal framework than a tech implementation um, tool, and so she suggested that uh, I go away and spearhead the blinding identity taxonomy. Um, so, um, and and this this all kind of links back into the uh, the schemas and overlays work that we're doing. Um, so I'll show you how that fits in. So this is a this is the blinding identity taxonomy. 
Uh, there's 44 elements in this taxonomy. It's now being housed by Kantara Initiative. Um, and uh, it's not, it hasn't been stamped by them yet for, uh, for a global uh, use, um, but it's, uh, it's in one of their working groups, the Consent uh, Information Group. Um, and uh, we're going through this uh, rigorously now to um, try and get it implemented, implemented as a global standard. Um, so the interesting uh, ones they just want to point out in the taxonomy at the moment here would be uh, the last one, freeform text fields, unstructured data, because um, I'm going to talk about that in a minute. And the other one is maybe dates, uh, which is the, um, the seventh uh, element down and on the right hand list, right, right hand side of the list, dates, date of birth, etc. OK. OK, so this is kind of how where it fits into the schema build. Um, so we've put it down as a bit schema object. So bit obviously stands for blinding identity taxonomy. And so it's not so much an overlay, it's actually built into the schema so that when an issuer um, issues, issues a schema, they can flag what elements are um, against the taxonomy, what, what elements um, have hit, have, um, are on the taxonomy so that um, it can be flagged and then subsequently, if you wanted to decentralize uh, data coming off that schema, um, it would be encrypted uh, as soon uh, on a public um, data store. Okay, so here we go. So this is how you create a schema with linked overlays. Um, okay, so this is a this is a demographic schema. So my my background is in is in uh, clinical trial working with clinical trial data um, mostly on the data management side um, and uh, and so the example you see here will, is is uh, is from a uh, an oncology study that i was working on so all you've got the base schema here um, is you've got the uh, the list of attributes and the types um, and then if i show you this is where the bit schema object comes in so obviously as the uh, as the issuer of the schema builds this the the um this this demographic schema he can now say okay so out of all of these attributes according to the blinded blinding identity taxonomy birth date should be marked as sensitive so he then marks this as sensitive and then as the schema goes through the life cycle, any actors that come across it will see that birth date has been marked as sensitive. So for, so for the holder of, of, of the data, um, they, uh, they can, it, it can flag, it'll flag to them that, that uh, someone's requesting sensitive data from them. Uh, and then the only other thing you have at the base schema is you've got uh, some schema met metadata. So everything in, in Everything in the architecture is um, is linked to a, a DID, which is a decentralized uh, identifier. Um, and so, as you can see, the metadata there contains um, contains a DID. Okay. So moving on. So this is the entry overlay. So you'll remember that um, uh, that you can use an entry overlay for predefined field values. Um, so what's interesting here is that if a uh, if an entry overlay um, is not on top of a schema, um, so, and uh, and the and there's the attributes are not being have not been um, uh, um, picked up by this entry overlay, um, the blending identity taxonomy would actually uh, flag that as a um, as a free form text field. Um, so, uh, so, so what we're trying to encourage people to do here is to put an entry overlay because if you think about it from a um, from an an analytics point of view, um, when you're trying to do analytics on uh, from a global data store, uh, if if you don't have predefined field values, uh, it's really that information becomes fairly useless to to anybody to use. On top of that freeform text fields, obviously we don't know what's being entered on, in those fields, so um, we automatically would flag that as sensitive. Um, okay, I'm just gonna move on to the next one. So this is the conditional overlay. Uh, you'll remember that I said that uh, you could do a little bit of conditional program programming on a schema. So for instance, 
this specific example, you've got um, this race to specific here uh, as a as a hidden attribute. And so in 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 our example, that uh, there was a question: um, Are you Asian? Yes, no. Uh, if if someone answered yes, then this uh, specific field would be would become unhidden, um, and and it's uh, more specific. So it would say, oh, um, are you Vietnamese? Are you Japanese? Etc. Um, so you can get get a bit of conditional programming going. Um, you'll see down the bottom, uh, the the last line within the conditional programming is age unit. Uh, in this case, it's basically if someone hasn't entered their age, then the age unit would remain hidden. Um, okay, so if you go to the, sort of the top of this um, this screen, you'll see that uh, we still have the uh, schema reference, and we have the overlay metadata. Um, so, um, so the link is obviously the schema DID. That's how you that's how you link these overlays to to the to the base schema. Okay, uh, the label overlay. Um, so this is uh, this is really good for language translations. So uh, in in this example, we have uh, the US US language definition, um, and this change this is where you can. Uh, you can change all of the attribute labels, or you can define uh, you can define categories and label categories uh, through this overlay. Again, it's, it has the same overlay metadata and the schema reference. Um, and uh, yeah, so um, if you wanted to change language, that would be the one to use. The informational overlay um, is for. Uh, Instructional text or informational text. Um, it could be legal prose, uh, or, you know, snippets, or it could be um, service hints. Um, that's how you'd use this informational overlay. Um, and again, if you wanted to do uh, a different language at this stage, you could, uh, you could, you could do a, um, you know, a, a German informational overlay or, or whatever you want. Um, so obviously, you know, the reason that we're doing all of these overlays, uh, if you, is really so that that base schema remains in its its absolute basic form, uh, in its most simple form, so that if you do decentralize data, uh, it should be in good shape. Everything that you're seeing here is just being layered on top of that schema, but it's it's uh, not affecting the data capture. Okay, the sensitive overlay. So. You'll remember me mentioning this. This is a little so so where where that bit schema object, the blinding identity taxonomy schema object, was for the issuer of a schema, so they could flag attributes according to the blinding identity taxonomy. This sensitive overlay um, approaches it uh, from a slightly different perspective. So this is a and and so in this instance, you'll see that it doesn't have a schema reference. It just has overlay metadata, um, so you know the issuer can use the blinding identity taxonomy schema object to flag um, to flag attributes, and then the holder could use this sensitive overlay to uh, to flag um, other attributes that that don't necessarily uh, fall under the the blinding identity taxonomy, but they might be attributes that that the holder is um, is skeptical about sharing. If you like, um, and then finally, uh, this is the subset overlay. Um, so the subset overlay is uh, if you just want to use uh, certain attributes for, from a schema, you would use this uh, this overlay, and it would basically um, just you just 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 pick up the attributes that you that you require. Um, the great thing about all of these overlays is is they um, they, you can have as many as you want on top of each other. Um, so, for instance, if you put this subset overlay in place, uh, you know there won't be any compilation errors or anything like that. It'll still it'll still keep all of the labeling, all of the conditional information, all of the informational information that you've used in in the previous overlays, and it will just keep the four attributes. So everything else will will stay the same. So now comes to the tricky part of the. Of this presentation, because we were having a few um, a few technical issues. Um, Robert, uh, or the demo is on a Linux machine, um, and uh, we were having trouble. Um, 
Okay. Silence. Sorry. Yeah, I just silenced you by by mistake. Um, but no. um, maybe Robert, can you can you hear us? Yes, I can hear you. Okay, great. So, do do you think we can? Uh, have you been able to set up the machine just to, for the demo to work? Yeah, or? I think I can choose that. So, let me try okay. it out. Oh, yeah, this looks good. Excellent. Perfect. Okay, great. Um, so. Yeah, so hello everyone. Uh, so as, as, as Paul already mentioned, uh, I would like to present to you a simple uh, a demo uh, where basically we prepared a simple script uh, which uh, uh, generates the schema and then basically allows you to apply a different overlays on top of that schema so you can see or get a better feeling about how actually this could work and uh, how actually this compile all together. So this is what you saw on the uh, on the slides. This is an example uh, schema, um, uh, which uh, which uh, we already created an object out of. Basically, just a short introduction to the demo. This is a very very technical demo. It's a simple Ruby script, which uh, which basically uh, there is just one class representing a schema, and then a few. Um, few attributes which allows you to apply overlays on on, on that object and, and basically play with different attributes, so which we which we'll see. Uh, all the stuff which I will present here is available on the GitHub. Um, uh, later on, we'll probably share the links, or if it's not already shared. Uh, so uh, we're starting with the schema. We have the list of the attributes, uh, which are pretty much uh, uh, key value uh, pairs where uh, the value is basically a type of the uh, of the attribute. We are thinking about putting this part in, into separate schema, which will be a formatting schema or encoding schema, which will keep also information not only about the format or the type of the attribute, but also about encoding or or any kind of uh, uh, different uh, information about specific value behind this attribute. For example, units. This is something which uh, which we are working on at the moment. So we have the list of the attributes. Then we have the bit attribute, so basically this blinding uh, taxonomy, uh, where we have just one field uh, by default marked within the schema as a sensitive information. And then, of course, we have the metadata, uh, which uh, represent uh, the, uh, the specific schema here. We're currently thinking about using the IDs for, uh, as a unique identifier of the schema. Um, and also, we are thinking about mixing up those, uh, those stuff together with the DID document, uh, which will kind of extend the functionality of it um, and fit, probably fit a bit better into the, the whole ecosystem. Um, so now, as you can see here, we have a schema overlays which return uh, empty. Uh, there is no overlay on top of it. Uh, and uh, the schema itself uh, has some uh, attributes. So basically the bid attributes, it lists all the attributes marked with all of them which are sensitive. Currently, as, uh, as we uh, talk about that, uh, we have just one attribute, which is marked red as a sensitive information. So you can imagine that from the user perspective, kind of user interface, that when you're building a, a, a interface for the user to fill out data or basically send a request to the user requesting those data, from the user perspective, you can mark right away which attributes are sensitive, which are not. Uh, then in addition of that, uh, we have a um, few uh, attributes which we can use on the object. I will just quickly hold values. Boss and attribute information. So basically, those are sorry, those are the information about the schema which we can get from the from the library. So we can figure out which fields are required. Currently none. Default values currently none. Schema attributes labels. Uh, every every label is basically empty, and the same attribute information. Everything is empty. And right now, let's try to apply an overlay on top of it, which will be. Uh, the first one, the entry overlay, 
um, where basically uh, it's more or less the same as you saw on this slide. We have the metadata uh, together with the reference to the schema um, DID. Then we have uh, the values. And here we have uh, attributes together with default values, which we uh, which we can set. And on the slides, we also saw that uh, we have a conditional overlay. Uh, currently in the demo, this is uh, those two things are together within one overlay, but we decided that actually the, this conditional part should be extracted to a separate overlay because it could be a bit more powerful than actually we thought at the beginning. But basically, the idea behind this piece is that you can build up some kind of simple logic uh, for the um, uh, for the schema. Uh, for example, hide some attributes, show some attributes based on the values uh, provided by the user, uh, or manipulate uh, a form uh, based on that how the user will fill out some fields. And currently, we have some simple uh, uh, logic syntax here, which define which attributes, for example, are hidden and which are required. So let's apply this. Uh, schema on our overlay. Now we can take a look. Um, within our object schema, we have one overlay, which is demographics entry. Uh, and right now we can uh, look up. that we already have default values for three attributes uh, based on the overlay which we applied. And the same with required attributes, we have three attributes which are required, uh, which from the user interface, we could uh, right away marked uh, properly to, to inform the user. So that's the first, um, uh, the first overlay. Let's click on the another one. which is the label overlay. Um, again, metadata about the overlay. Then we have a specific attribute which tells us about the language of, the, uh, of, the, of this overlay. It means that, for example, we can pick up the specific overlay which is um, uh, preferred by the user. So we could look up that uh, the user identity requested uh, the, the overlay in English or Polish or any other language, and we could provide a specific one. And then we have the attributes label. So basically, this what this uh, overlay does is provide a human readable uh, 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 attribute names, which can be presented directly uh, to the user. And in addition of the uh, labels, we also have something which uh, which uh, are currently called cate categories. Uh, which the idea behind this is that you could create from the kind of presentation point of view, you could aggregate some attributes and present them together with some um, uh, logical block. And also you can use the, the label uh, overlay to, to, to provide them uh, um, uh, some, some human readable uh, names. So let's apply this overlay. And now if we take a look on the Attribute labels. We have all the attributes uh, already colorated with the with the human readable uh, values. And uh, if we take a look on the again on the list of the overlays, we already have two of them: demographic entry and demographic English labels. And together with uh, since the, the 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 labels are tied to a specific language, we could, for example, apply another language play on top of it. Mm. We have uh, another uh, label overlay, which is uh, Polish language. And as soon as we'll apply uh, this, uh, this overlay, we can right away get uh, the same result, but with the, with the proper translation. And here is uh, uh, empty value, which is, uh, 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 which is done 
uh, uh, just to present how those overlays merge it, each other right now, or at least what, what is the idea. Means that if the overlays somehow outdated, it's not, uh, uh, for example, um, um, uh, properly synced with the schema which we are using together with it, uh, it doesn't break anything. Basically, everything which is not into that what is within the schema is ignored. For example, if the attribute name changed somehow or if, uh, if it doesn't exist anymore, basically this field will be skipped or ignored completely. So there will not be um, any, uh, any error thrown or anything like that. And just, just, uh, Robert, yeah. just a little question here coming from Michael. He, he's asking um, if it's okay for you. Um, if, um, sure. Can some of these, for example, lookup table list of values be saved by name and reused across multiple schema that's his question mm, i'm not sure if i got the question uh, yeah, he's asking can some of these for example look up table list of va of values and mm -hmm. then be saved by a name and reused across multiple schemas or across multiple schema so I assume that the question is re regarding the translation part. That yeah. he, he would but like to reuse some sort of already translated fields or yeah. attributes, which, uh, yeah, which later on could be reused. So, for example, if I'm creating a schema, I'm providing English translation for it, but the rest comes from community, which already mo mostly translated most of the attributes which I'm uh, reusing. And, yeah. and basically, the answer is yes. Uh, this what we are planning to use within those uh, this schema ecosystem is something which is called schema element. Or at least we are naming it like that. The idea is that basically you can decouple the schema for uh, to 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 the level of the attribute. So each attribute is a uh, atomic unit, which can uh, exist uh, uh, and can be reused within another schema. So. Uh, this this kind of provide you also possibility to include another schema within uh, uh, within other schema it means that you can combine them all together. So as soon as the community community starting, for example, translation sets uh, or uh, different uh, different types of the schema, you can reuse those pieces and combine them together to the schema which you actually are interested to use. Yeah, yeah. Mario is also saying here, like for example, a common list of country names. For any pick field called country, exactly. Yeah, so it could be it could be that the community already provided uh, default values for for the fields like uh, cities uh, or or countries or anything like that. There is a dictionary already provided uh, for that. And here the example is this is what is happening in the schema.org space and all this. Uh, predefined data structure which are up there. We are planning to reuse them, means that actually you can tie it or link to them uh, with the data graph uh, properly to, to already existing dic dic dictionary uh, up there and reuse those information. So you need to remember also that this schema overlay is a very early stage uh, uh, work in progress stuff. So there is a lot of still not defined uh a lot of pieces are not defined yet and also we are trying to to uh, to evolve that in a direction uh that it will basically fit into the, the, the whole ecosystem and reuse as much as possible so we don't want to reinvent uh stuff from scratch good good so uh we already have to uh we applied to um uh, label overlays. So when we'll take a look on the list of the overlays, uh, we see that we are missing the English labels because the, the, the Polish labels replace the English one. We are also thinking about the way to, because right now the order of the overlays are pretty much defined. And, and normally if you come all them together, it doesn't matter in which order you will apply them, the result at the end will be always the same. Uh, this is what we are thinking about is to allow actually merge those uh, overlays means that for example if we apply the english one first as a default uh, overlay uh, for the labels then if there is a, a, another language like polish one we can apply the uh, as a second overlay and after compiling it 
everything which is within the Polish labels uh, will be used, and the fallback will be will be the English labels tr uh, uh, translation. So basically, we could merge them together and and make some kind of diffs uh, and and compose a different uh, different overlays together. Um, but this is this is something which we need to figure out how this actually could be applied and how this will work out uh, in the in the real use case. Okay, good. So next one, information overlay. So the information overlay, as, as Paul already mentioned, is a kind of extra context to the attribute. So uh, here we have just a simple hint how to fill out uh, the attributes, but uh, it could be anything. It could be, for example, legal restriction, like why you should fill it out or why you should share those information, why we are asking for it, or maybe some uh, some specific information about the region where you're collecting those information um, and, uh, and help out help users to understand why they should share that information basically it could be anything uh this is this is a, a simple key value pairs where you have attributes and um, and the context which you want to add to a specific attributes same as label overlay is tied to a language so you can replace them with a different um uh with different uh version of those overlays in different languages Let's apply it. And now we see that basically for those attributes where the translate or the context uh, provided within the overlay exists, we see that the attributes provide that information here. And the same as uh, with the label overlay, we can replace it with another language. And, and then basically easily we can get the proper translation for the user it depends on uh, his preferences. So that's the uh, information overlay. Now we have another one, which is the subset overlay. Uh, this is also, um, uh, you already saw that on the slide, so it's a very simple one, metadata, of course, and then the list of the attributes which we are requesting from the user. So the, the main purpose of it is to, to reduce the amount of the information which we are requesting from the user uh, in the sense that we could use a schema which is pretty well known within the ecosystem. Let's say it's provided by a trusted uh, entity, for example, uh, uh, a Linux foundation issue, uh, a schema which is used for uh, uh, user profiles online. And then we would like to base on that schema, but we don't, don't want to request all the fields which are within the schema, but only a specific one, because we just require those three or four. And then we can limit it, and then the user could uh, could uh, could be bothered only about the the required fields which which we are asking, and as soon as we apply the schema on our uh, apply the overlay on the schema, we would see that basically what attributes operation will do right now. Uh, like for example, the attribute information, you will see that everything is automatically cut to the to the subset which we defined within the schema overlay. And if we'll take a look on the on the list of the overlays, we'll see that the subset overlay appears as the second one. This is where um, uh, I mentioned about this order of the overlays. Uh, in theory, it should not matter in which order you will apply them, but currently is. Uh, uh, its uh, subset is cutting off all the attributes which are not needed for the uh, for any manipulation in the further uh, overlay, so it just reduced the uh, the effort. Uh, within those simple examples which we're showing here, maybe that's not a big difference. But if you talk about like a huge schema for uh, for uh, clinical trials or, or stuff like that, where there's hundreds of uh, attributes, uh, uh, there is no to combine them and manipulate each attribute and at the end just cut them off. You can do it right away. Um, good. And then the last overlay, which is my favorite one, is the sensitive overlay. This is a very specific one. Uh, 
which is not tied directly to any uh, uh, schema. So basically, within the metadata, you won't see the reference to the, uh, to the schema. The idea behind it uh, is uh, similar to that what we're currently uh, using, uh, for example, as an ad block uh, solution uh, within the browser. So we as a users, we are defining what is sensitive information in our opinion. It can be done by us. It could be done by a trusted entity, uh, which can help us to protect our um, uh, our data. Uh, again, let's say there is a trusted entity like Linux Foundation. They are issuing a sensitive overlay, which anybody can use within their uh, digital wallets and say that uh, those information, whoever will ask for it, those are sensitive information and the application or the software which you are using will mark them uh, immediately as a sensitive so you will see immediately that you need to pay attention what you're sharing uh, uh, to others and here as we can see there is one extra uh, one extra attribute marked which is the age and just quickly remind uh, the, the list of the bit attributes which we which are coming directly from the schema. Currently, the list of the attributes uh, uh, is limited. Due to that, we apply the subset overlay only to four. And from the schema, uh, the outer marked uh, the birthday um, uh, as a sensitive information. So we see that right away. And as soon as we will apply the um, sensitive overlay, We'll see that this comes from the schema, and this, uh, in addition, was marked due to this extra overlay on top of it. This is very handy for the kind of user protection activities uh, um, uh, in uh, in a different uh, different aspect. So this is how this uh, this is how it works. We build that uh, this uh, simple um, uh, script to. Uh, to present how this could work and also for ourselves to uh, a little bit experiment with it. And the next steps uh, for us is to continue the development of uh, of simple library, which allows you to create a schema, overlays, and basically play with them. Um, and uh, the most interesting part, which I think is worth to mention, is that actually we are thinking about using uh, DID, so decentralized identity, uh, de decentralized uh, identifier, uh, and the DID doc, which is describing uh, DID, to actually host the schema and host the overlay. So uh, it will be like fully compatible with the, um, uh, with the ecosystem, which is built on top of the DIDs and uh, and any kind of SSI solution, which is based on DID specs could right away be able to support schema and the overlays uh, uh, concepts which which we are working on. Go okay, ahead. so thank you very much. If there are some more questions, feel free yeah, to I ask. Yeah, I think we have a couple of questions upcoming here, if you're ready. Ready. <laughs> okay, um, so um, Michael is asking, Is this, I mean, just from this last part, is this a form of field level access control authorization or just for visual indication high lightning? Yeah, so this is this is basically a presentation layer. So just highlighting, because of course, if there is a bad actor within the, the, the system, then of course you always can manipulate something. And this is this is basically the idea of applying schema and overlays is that, or it will be done on the, on the agent side. So someone who is keeping your data securely, right? Or uh, hosting your your private data and then exposing it to the to the end of to the to the rest of the world, or uh, this this uh, this the software which is run. So this is this is some kind of, sometimes the companies where they are operating on a big amount of data they are using some kind of data pipelines to to push the data through the whole company and each department will receive those data. Uh, it depends on uh, on the the require required. Uh, Kind of um, based on the requirements from from those those departments, so they don't need to see everything. So you can before you push those data out, you apply those overlays, and then you always make sure that they will receive the data which uh, uh, which uh, are meant for them. So definitely, this is much more in the context of the presentation. 
Excellent. There were there were a couple of other <coughs> sorry, a couple of other questions coming from Michael, but I had so, also some questions for for Paul. Maybe Paul, if you can also come back um, with your voice. And um, if, yeah. if we go back, I mean, just for for the not so technical people, um, what 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 is like the the, the basic explanation about um, what, what schemas are and and how overlays help in that context? I mean, just for everyone. Was not technical to, to understand this a little bit more. Sure. So, um, so if you think about uh, like a, a web web reg registration form, um, you know they're all going to be quite similar. Whether you're you're signing up to use, uh, you know, Facebook or Twitter or LinkedIn. So the idea the idea of the schemas and the overlays is you could you could basically have one registration schema. And then you could have Facebook using the same schema and Twitter using the same schema, uh, LinkedIn using the same schema. Um, but they might all have slightly, slightly different uh, coloration that they need on that schema. So um, and so, uh, you know, Facebook could uh, build um, their own suite of overlays for that registration schema. Um, and then that would that would be as you currently see the Facebook sign up, it would be exactly the same, but they're still using the same sign up schema that maybe Twitter might use. Um, so there's, so it, it doesn't change any, the only thing, and the reason that we're trying to do it that way is so that all of the data that's being captured, um, it's, it's um, it, when, it, when it's, if you wanted to decentralize it to a, uh, to a global data store, um, it's very easy to to push them into um, public access tables. Um, so, for example, it, there's there's two ways that you could go about doing this. If you started from the attribute level, and what I mean by attribute level is you know birth date of birth, first name, last name, the the individual attributes, and you wanted to put overlays on each of those separately without defining the schema. If you were ever to decentralize that data, it would be almost impossible to do it. You wouldn't know exactly where to decentralize it to. So, for example, if you had, um, you know, expiry date, right? Expiry date can be, you know, the food in your fridge can have an expiry date or a, a gym membership can have an expiry date. So, you know, if, if it's not attached to a schema, then it just loses its context. And so if you did decentralize it uh, and it wasn't attached to a schema, it would be thrown into the same variable, probably in the same uh, data table, uh, which is no good for anybody. It becomes useless information. So the way we've approached it is di is, is different. We've 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 approached it from the schema level, so it immediately has context. And then if you need to get down to the attribute level, if you just want date of date of birth, or in, or for the example I just gave, if you just wanted expiry date. Um, you could just use a subset overlay and just pick that pick that variable out. But the schema the schema information is still held, so it's so it still has its context. So when you decentralize it, it goes to the correct place. Does that make sense? No, it absolutely <coughs> make, makes sense. What what is the context of? Um, just let me remember the name because I didn't see them before. Like uh, the BIT, like the the blinding identity taxonomy. Um, yeah so um so that taxonomy um that was a that was a piece that we picked up quite early that, that we saw was a potential uh red flag on a um for if you were to decentralize data um and the idea of that is so we went away and built this taxonomy it went through the um the ssi community it went through the my data community it went through big data analytics community and the GDPR people, and we just started building this taxonomy. And, and the idea was that um, you know the if you if a, if an issuer is is built is creating a schema and they're part of a trusted framework, they are they those people are going to have the expertise of what sensitive data is. So that's why we give them access to use that bit schema object. Um, so for instance, in the example we used, we were using a demographics form you know, that would usually be issued by a, a pharma company. Um, so, you know, you know, Roche Pharmaceuticals would have expertise to know what is, uh, um, what would constitute 
um, PII data. So that bit schema object just allows them to flag um, certain attributes. And then the, the beauty of that is once it's flagged, uh, you know, you might not want to decentralize it immediately, but as soon as you decentralize it to a public space um, and those PII um, attributes have been flagged, they can automatically be encrypted on a, on a public data store. So even if a hacker came and hacked that data store, which we hope they don't do, but if they did, then um, the information there, you know, they, they can't get back down to the, uh, the individual. They can't figure out who the individual is because all of the PII data has been encrypted. Nice. Just a more general business question too. Like, I mean, what are the, <coughs> the main business areas where you can imagine that will benefit from this? Yeah, so the, the main one is, um, so I'm going to stick with the pharmaceuticals for a while because that's obviously the, the area I know. Um, the big pharma companies, are, are they're quite happy to share their data, um, but what they, ha what they have is they have uh, d departments um, or, or, or groups within departments that their main job is to transform the data that they have and so that, they, so that when they push it into a... a um, a, uh, a merged space with other uh, other pharmaceutical companies. Um, every pharmaceutical has a company has uh, the, the data is in a similar structure. So the business process is basically by doing it this way with the um, with the simple schema and overlays is that those departments or those groups are basically redundant. Because uh, at the click of a button, um, they can or the data decentralization is is in in rock solid shape. So from a business perspective, uh, those uh, transformation data transformation groups are redundant. The other thing uh, is uh, the um, you know the amount of storage um, that uh, they might be using on servers and stuff like that. Um, Basically, they, once they decentralize it, they don't need to hold on to that data anymore. It's it's really interesting with, with some of the companies. Um, you know, everyone thought that data was something that they didn't want to get get rid of, but now they're realizing that it actually it's becoming uh, a, it's 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 an issue for them because uh, you know if if someone hacks into their databases, they're liable. So if they can decentralize it and put it to societal benefit then uh, it's uh, a lot of the big companies are, would be quite happy to do that. So for instance, with the pharmaceutical companies, they make their money by getting uh, drugs approved by the FDA and on the shelf. That's how they make their money. They don't make money by, um, by holding on to a load of data. So thank you very much. Um, if I, I may add, add something to, oh. to, to this. Uh, because I don't know if you Paul mentioned about that or if I missed that. The important part is that the schema and the overlays provides you this universal language, which then they can use to communicate across different entities and get those data or you know move around those data. Because without this language, then this decentralization or moving the data anywhere is super tricky because everyone will have own way of storing and naming and you know putting context into it and there, there is no um, uh, universal way to 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 operate with that and this is where the schema and the overlays come uh, very handy does it also help in the sense of <coughs> i mean this is just one of the subjects i've been wondering about like um if, if you have because i mean there's like no schema standard right now the way I understand it. So, will will this help in, in, in that direction of standardization of of, of 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 unifying schemas across the board, like a instead of having marketplaces of schemas? Yeah. So let me take that one, Robert. Um, so so we're going to work really closely with uh, schema.org um, and uh, from a healthcare perspective, uh, hl7.org, which is um, is is heavily linked to schema.org. So that any you know that's where they're doing all the all the um, standard standardization for attributes and also schema. Um, so we'll work very closely with them um, to make sure that uh, we're we're all um, you know we're all dovetailing together. Um, you know we 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 don't want it so we we basically want the schema to be 
um, you know, obvious which ones uh, are needed to use for different trusted frameworks. Um, so that's why that's why everything has uh, has uh, DIDs and stuff like that because it's it's once once you know if they're locked onto a ledger, for example. I'm not saying they have to be locked into a ledger, but if they were, they they become searchable for blockchain use. Um, if they're not locked into a ledger, then they, you know, they could be linked to a uh, some sort of um, reference table or something like that. Um, and and by doing that, you know, you can quickly you can quickly say, oh, you know, for this particular schema, uh, I wonder what the what the most popular conditional overlay is. And some and and in that case, the conditional overlay might become uh, the industry standard for that within that trusted framework. Um, yeah, uh, sorry, I was kind of waffling there, but hope I, hopefully I got my point across. No, absolutely. Is, is there any way, because I mean, <coughs> Paul, you're, you're the chair of the schemas and overlays working group uh, at the Sovereign Foundation. Is there any way for people to get involved or is there something you're looking for from other people about how they can help with uh, the work you're doing? Absolutely. We're, we're actually, um, that, uh, that working group is actually going to uh, um, disband um, it's kind of gone up a level now. Uh, it's been promoted to the Hyperledger Indie uh, layer of the stack. Um, and it's been called the schematics uh, group. So uh, maybe maybe what I'll do is I'll give, um, Alex, I'll give you uh, instructions on how people can join that uh, that channel. Yeah, um, please. And then, yeah, and then, yeah, we'd love to have in input from uh, everyone on this call. Absolutely. Yeah, for, for any additional links or, or context you want to share, please just send it to me and I'll I'll put it up in the post um, um, once we upload um, the video and everything. Just I have one more question coming up here from, from Michael. Let, yeah. let me see if you're, if you're um, the, comfortable with that one. I, I guess you are. There's no problem. Just um, he's asking, um, I'm, I would like to ask a more general question about Indie Schema. And, and then he's asking, can a common aggregated attribute like address be defined separate separate from the multiple schemas in which it is used? And then he's giving an example, like in-person address, org address, purchase order bill to address, purchase order ship to address, way ship to address, et cetera. Mm -hmm. Robert, do you want to take that one? Yeah, I can. So. So basically, the answer is yes, uh, and this is where uh, where this those schema elements and the basically uh, embedding different schemas within another schema uh, comes very handy because you can define a schema, a very simple schema, which includes just a few attributes representing just an address, and then you can use that within the schema, which will be called a personal address or the company address, and then basically you build up those structures, which is derived from one common place. So it's very easy to uh, to reuse those small pieces and combine them together. Okay, very good. Um, <coughs> Michael also has another question here. Like, and if anyone else has a question, please let us know. If not, um, I guess that will be the last one. Um, um, are you also working with Oasis regarding the universal business language standards for the 81 most common business document schemas? Robert, you should probably take that one as well. But all I'll say on that is that you know it's going to be totally uh, platform um, agnostic, and at the same time, it will, will we will link in, link in with all of the standards um, um, standards bodies. Um, but Robert, do you have anything else to say on that? Yeah, basically, we are not working directly with those, but uh, this is what we are trying to figure out right now is that uh, to yeah, kind of uh, scan the, the the space and figure out who is doing what and try to uh, to uh, to build up some kind of higher level uh, construct uh, kind of standard for uh, all those domains together. So one one of the thing which uh, which I already mentioned is this DAD and the DDoc stuff, which basically uh, is a, a kind of uh, merging standard for any kind of SSI network, and this is from which space we came uh, from and this is why we are starting from there but if you are aware of any similar 
uh, initiative and, and, and standards or even uh, some kind of uh, uh, work done within that uh, data transformation uh, part uh, and data structurization part, please let us know for sure we'll uh, uh, dive into it and figure out how actually uh, we, can, uh, we can fit that, what we are doing into that. Absolutely. I think you know the one that we're going to um, that we're going to uh, go for is uh, schema.org uh, 2.0 will be the the one that we go for. So if it if it means that we we need uh, adapter pieces to um, go from one one format to a to this other format, then um, hopefully the community can help us uh, help us build some of those pieces. Yeah. yeah, Mike is just adding, is, um, is Indy going forward with its own schema standards or can a framework incorporate any standard? Uh, any, anyone can build their own schema, um, so then they don't have to come from, uh, from a standardized place. Um, any issuer can, can build their own schemas, um, nothing stops that. Okay, so I guess that's, that's all the questions, unless Michael, if you have something else, let me know no he's happy excellent so um, um paul and robert thank you very much for having joined us today this is, this is great and as you make progress with all this great work um i think it would be great to catch up again when, when the time is right for you and um so thank you very much and um, for everyone else who's joining us today um we will be uploading this very soon and you will be able to listen to this and use the slides we will share it share them via google slides so that you can reuse them across the world and paul and robert will share some more links with uh, with us which we will upload too and as always um, um check us out and um, also in sign up to the newsletter and telegram or twitter and all the other channels where we are next monday we will be speaking with marcus savadello um about um um did auth um and uh, no did did resolver and um so yeah so we will um, be talk um, getting more deeply into the, all the stuff and paul and robert thank you very much for for being with us today and i look, look forward to see much more of, of what you're doing Perfect. Thanks, Alex. Thank you. Thank bye -bye. you very much for having us. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Bye-bye.